The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Great pleasure to be in Woods Hole, uh, my first visit here. Had a wonderful swim in the sea yesterday. Sheffield Robotics is across both universities in Sheffield, and uh, it's been founded since 2011, but we've really been doing uh, robotics since the 1980s, and I joined them in 1989. And we do uh, pretty much every different kind of uh, robotics, but I'm gonna talk about biomimetics. I also do what you might call cognitive robotics, and I collaborate with Giorgio Meta on that, but since he's speaking to, I'm gonna focus on the more animal-like robots that we've been developing. So this is uh, uh, one of our latest projects. This is uh, a small uh, autonomous uh, mobile robot, which is a commercial platform, which will be available in the UK, I think, next January. Uh, and uh, there will hopefully be a, a developer program for people that are interested in helping to develop the intelligence for this robot. Um, so th this is at a conference we had in Barcelona uh, last month. And uh, you can see that it's a, it's a robot pet. Uh, and uh, uh, we've been focusing on giving it uh, some uh, uh, effective communication abilities, responding particularly to touch. You can see that it's orienting to uh, stimuli. Uh, it has stereo vision, it has stereo sound, and it can orient to uh, visual stimuli uh, and also to auditory stimuli. Here we're showing it a picture of itself on this magazine cover. Um, and the goal is to demonstrate that we can, in a commercial robot that will cost uh, less than $1,000, considerably less, uh, some of the principles of how the brain generates behavior. So this robot is called Miro, uh, is based on some high-level principles abstracted from what we know about how mammalian brains control behavior. So it's a relatively complex robot, 13 degrees of freedom, three arm processors corresponding to different levels, if you like, of uh, the neuraxis, the, the central nervous system. So I um, uh, want to sort of start out with some general ideas and questions and issues about how we might learn from uh, the biology in the brain, how to develop robots, and how we might use robots to help us understand the brain. And a central question, I think, that uh, robotics can help us answer, uh, and I think that's a core question in neuroscience, is what you might call the problem of behavioral integration. And uh, the neuroscientist Ernest Barrington uh, summarized this quite nicely. He said, the phenomenon so characteristic of living organisms, so very difficult to analyze, the fact that they behave as wholes rather than as the sum of their constituent parts, their behavior shows integration a process unifying the actions of an organism into patterns that involve the whole individual. And this picture of a squirrel over here, I think nicely demonstrates this. So of course, this, the squirrel is leaping from one branch to the next, and you can see that every part of his body is coordinated and organized for this action. So you can see that his eyes looking straight ahead, his, his whiskers, and I'll talk a lot more about whiskers, are pointing forward. His, uh, uh, his arms and his feet are, are already, and they're, that they're there ready to catch his fall. Uh, even his tail is, is angled and positioned to help him fly through the air. So it's the coordination of the different parts of the body and the multiple degrees of freedom of the body and the sensory systems uh, in space and in time, which I think is a critical problem for uh, biological control and also a problem for robots, which we're still struggling to address with our robots. And I wanna give you two very general principles for thinking about how brains solve this problem. So uh, many of you uh, will have come across Rodney Brooks, yes, from MIT, and he's famous for, uh, in robotics, the notion of lead control, which he calls subsumption. And uh, I think the ideas that he brought into robotics really changed how people thought about robots in the 1980s. But uh, if we go back to the 1880s, uh, John Hewlings Jackson, uh, who was a British neurologist, proposed a similar idea but with respect to the nervous system. So uh, in the 1880s, 
People thought about uh, the higher areas of the brain, particularly the, the, the cortex, as being about higher thought and, and reasoning and language, and not so much about perception and action. And Hewlings Jackson, I think, was revolutionary in his day in saying that the highest motor centers represent over again in more complex combinations what the middle motor centers represent. In other words, he was saying that the whole of the brain all the way up is about coordinating perception with action. And he described it in many senses as a layered system. He talked about how you could take off the top layers of the system and the competencies of the lower layers remained intact, which of course is very much the idea of Rodney Brooks' subsumption architecture. And uh, some old studies uh, that did transaction in animals like cats and rats demonstrate this nicely. So if you take a cat or a rat, particularly a rat, and you remove, in fact, all of the uh, cerebral cortex, so if you uh, make a slice here that takes away cortex, you get an animal that actually, to all appearances, looks fairly normal. It does motivated behavioral sequences. So it will get hungry, and it will look for food, and it will eat. Uh, if there's an appropriate mate nearby, it will uh, look to have a sexual relationship. And uh, it, it, it will fail in some challenges, such as learning, and perhaps also in dexterous control, but in many ways it will look normal. If you slice below uh, the other part of the forebrain, the, 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 uh, the thalamus and the hypothalamus, you remove these areas, then you remove this capacity for motivated behavior, but you leave intact midbrain systems that can still generate individual actions. And if you remove parts of the midbrain, you leave intact still component movements. So, for example, animals that can run on a treadmill. So, uh, we are, with our mirror robot, loosely recapitulating uh, this architecture. So we have three processes, and the idea with this robot is actually a part work. So you build it up, you get a mag magazine every week with a new part for the robot, and you build essentially a spinal robot first, and then you add a midbrain processor. Eventually, you add a cortical processor, uh, which br gives with it some learning capacities, some pattern recognition, some navigation. So that's one principle, uh, layered architecture, which seems to work both for biology and perhaps in robotics. So second principle, and uh, this goes back to another famous neuroscientist, uh, this time Wilder Penfield, who is, is known to many people for his discovery of somatotopic maps in the brain, that if you stimulate uh, in the brain uh, in the area, uh, the sensory area, then you find that people have experience of tickling on parts of the body and adjacent uh, parts of cortex correspond to adjacent parts of the body. And he found a similar homunculus in the motor area that you stimulate and you get movement in adjacent parts of the body. And he also uh, proposed uh, another idea, and that was a sort of a, centren a transencephalic dimension to nervous system organization. And that's to say that the uh, down the midline of the central nervous system, there are a group of structures that don't seem to be specifically involved in specific aspects of perception and action, but seem to be about integration. And amongst them, particularly the basal ganglia, uh, he noted as being important in parts of the reticular formation. So uh, Michael Frank was here talking to you about uh, basal ganglia, so I'm not going to uh, say much more about this, but this is just to point out in, in a slice in the rat brain, these are the elements of the uh, basal ganglia, particularly the striatum is the input system uh, in the rat, the substantia nigra, and part of the globus pallidus are the output systems. And then uh, you have in the rat brain and also in, in our brains, you have massive convergence onto the input area, the cortic putamen it is also called, from the cortex and from the brainstem. So you have signals coming in from all over the brain to the striatum, which could be interpreted as a request for action. And then you have inhibition coming out from the output structures of the basal ganglia. Here I'm showing it for the substantia nigra, going back to all of those areas of the brain. And this inhibition is tonic, and in order to have voluntary action, you have to remove the inhibition. So this is a, a, a system that can give you uh, some of that behavioral integration that you need, the ability to ensure that you do one thing at a time, you do that uh, quickly, you do that consistent, <coughs> consistently, you dedicate all of your resources to the action that you want to do. Uh, here's a, a little video of a rat, and I'm showing you some 
uh, integrated behavior over time in an intact rat. So this is a, a rat exploring in a, a, a large container, and rats generally don't like open spaces. So when you first put the animal into this space, it will tend to stay near the walls, and it prefers this corner, which is dark. And of course, it's hungry too, so uh, there's a dish of food here, and eventually it gets up the courage to go out, collect a piece of food, and it will take it back into this dark corner to consume it. And uh, one of the first models that we built was a model of basal ganglia operating as this kind of action selection device. And with a simple Kepra robot, uh, this is a robot that just really uses infrared sensors and a gripper arm. And we are uh, using a model of the basal ganglia to, to control decision making about which actions to do at which time and to generate sequences, sequencing of those actions. So uh, as uh, the, the need to stay close to walls diminishes, the uh, robot, like the rat, goes and collects these cylinders and it carries them back into the corners and deposits them. So a model of these central brain structures, and uh, I'm happy to discuss in more detail about how that model operates. It has similarities to the model that Michael will have described to you. But that's controlling the, the behavior switching, if you like, in this robot. So uh, I spent some time working on this, this question of, of how central systems in the brain, particularly the basal ganglia, are involved in the integration of behavior. But I, I became frustrated with not understanding what were the signals coming in to these central brain structures, and not understanding what effects those brain structures were having on the, the motor system of the animal. So I thought that what we needed to do was look at complete sensory motor loops. We look, needed to look at sensing and action and how those interact. And uh, in our psychology department, we have a neuroscience group that works mainly with rats. So it was natural for us to, to look at the rat. And in the rat, we know that uh, one of the key perception systems is the vibrissal system. So here you see, this is actually a pet rat wandering around on, on my windowsill in my house in Sheffield. And the thing to notice is the whiskers here. Um, and the whiskers are moving back and forth pretty much all the time that the rat is exploring. And uh, we understand from nearly 100 years now of research that this system is very important for the rat to understand the environment. In fact, if, if it's completely dark, the rat would move around in much the same way, and it would be able to understand the, the, the world through touch pretty, pretty well, even in the absence of vision. So this is the same video, but now slowed down 10 times. And just to show you uh, these movements of the whiskers and how quite precise they are, because the rat isn't just in a stereotypical way, banging its whiskers against the floor, it is likely touching the whiskers in places that will get useful information. And you can see when he uh, puts his head over the windowsill here, the whiskers push forward as if he knows that he's going to have to reach further forward if he's going to find anything. Here you see him exploring this uh, wooden cup, and you can see light touches by the whiskers. And uh, you can also see that the movement of the whiskers is being modulated by the shape of the surface that he's investigating. So there's some fairly subtle control happening here, and I think it's not too much to say that the way in which the rat controls its whiskers has almost the same richness as the way that we control our fingertips. So I'm interested in how this plays out in terms of a layered architecture story. And uh, of course, many people study this system. The beauty of it is, if you're a neuroscientist, that uh, you can look in the cortex. This is, this is rat cortex here. And a huge area of rat cortex is dedicated to somatosensation, to touch, of which a large area is dedicated to whiskers. In fact, if you zoom in, you can find this area called barrel cortex. And with the right kind of staining, you can find groups of cells which uh, preferentially receive signals from individual whiskers. So for example, you can move uh, one whisker here, and you can know exactly where to record in the barrel cortex to get a very strong response from that whisker. And this means that barrel cortex and the whisker system has become one of the prepared, preferred preparations in which to study the cortical microcircuit uh, altogether. So people study this system to really understand how cortex operates. Now, if we think about this system as a pathway from the whiskers up to barrel cortex, we're really only capturing one element of what's going on in the vibrissal system and that's this pathway here. Uh, 
from the vibrissae via the trigeminal complex goes by the thalamus up to sensory cortex. And this is probably where 9 out of 10 papers on this system are published. But actually, this system is only part of a looped architecture, or we might say a layered architecture. And at each level of this layered architecture, there's a completed loop uh, so that sensing can affect action. So sensing on the vibrissae can affect the movement and control of the vibrissae. So there's a, a loop via the brainstem here, so that uh, directly from the trigeminal complex, signals come back to the facial nucleus, which is where the motor neurons are that move the whiskers. There's a loop via the midbrain here, so that sensory signals ascend very quickly to the midbrain superior colliculus, and they come back to affect how the whiskers move. And then, of course, there's the loop uh, via the cortex too. So there's essentially those three loops, at least, that we need to think about. So since uh, 2003, we've been building different whiskered robots, uh, the aim being to instantiate our theories about how whiskered control works in this layered architecture and demonstrate it in a robot platform. And often actually building a robot platform causes us to ask new questions that might not be obvious to you just by uh, doing biological experiments or even by doing simulation. Before I show you some robots, just quickly show you a little bit more about the rat and its whiskers. So we began thinking we could just build robots, but we quickly realized that we didn't know enough about how rats use their whiskers to do that. And that's partly because the experiments that had been done hadn't been done with the purpose of building a whiskered robot. So when you uh, try and build a whiskered robot, you have to ask questions like, how do the whiskers move? And when you look at a video like this, filmed from above, this is with a high-speed camera, you think, well, the whiskers are, are sweeping backward and forward like this. Uh, but in fact, if you put a mirror just tilted down here and you see what happens, then it, it turns out to be a little bit different. So you see that the whiskers are going up and down as much as they're going backwards and forwards. So the whiskers are actually sweeping like this and they're making a series of touches on the surface. And if you watch, you can see that the whiskers are sort of playing down on the surface sort of in a sequence quite quickly. So that information but might be giving you uh, details about the shape of the surfaces in your world. So we mainly look at the long whiskers. This is a rat that's running up an alley, and we put an unexpected object in the alley, which could be this aluminium uh, re rectangle, or it could be this plastic step. And what you see is if the animal encounters something unexpected with its long whiskers, then it turns very quickly and investigates it. So the long whiskers are like the periphery of a sensory system that has a fovea. And the fovea at the center of that system is a, a set of short whiskers around the mouth, also the lips uh, and uh, the nose, so that you can sniff and smell the surface that you're investigating. So we can zoom in and see that uh, sensory fovea here. You see these short whiskers that are being used to investigate this plastic pup, puck, and the longer whiskers investigating around the outside. So we have recap recapitulated elements of this layered architecture in our robot. And this is th these are the loops. And this was about five years ago. We would built a system with a brainstem loop and really a midbrain loop. And this is our, our robot Scratchbot, which uh, is uh, the first of the whiskered robots that we felt really was capturing uh, whisking in the, the way that the rat does it. It's, it's running at about four hertz, whereas uh, uh, the real rat is whisking from 8 to 12 hertz, but you know, it's scaled up to be about four times rat size. And what it's doing here is it's using the whiskers to orient to stimuli. So this is Martin Pearson from Bristol Robotics Lab. He's putting an object in the whisker field, and the robot is turning and orienting to the touch with the object. It's putting its short micro vibrissae, in fact, against the object and exploring it. Now, to to do that, to detect the stimulus on the whiskers and then turn, it's not a fantastically hard task. The main challenge is to uh, work out where the whisker was in its sweep when you made contact with an object because the whisker is sweeping back and forth. So if you want to know the location of the point of contact, you need to integrate uh, the position of the whisker in its, sleep, in its sweep, what you might call a theta signal, uh, and the presence of a contact on the whiskers. And the coincidence of those two is detected in the brain, and we know that there are cells in the barrel cortex that respond to that coincidence. 
So we have in our robot a model of superior colliculus, which is the location in the brain which we think is involved in orienting. And uh, in our model of the colliculus, we have a head-centered map which looks for this coincidence between uh, a cell encoding the position of the whisker in its sweep and a, a cell encoding a contact and makes a turn to orient and explore that position. And then if we want to actually create behavior uh, which is integrated over time, so if the robot was just to orient every time it touched something, uh, that wouldn't be very animal-like, particularly you don't want to orient and, uh, every time you touch the ground. So you just want to orient when you touch important stimuli. So we, we put into our model the basal ganglia so that we can uh, decide whether the contact we've just made is something we want to investigate or something that doesn't interest us so much. So we have a system now with uh, uh, a midbrain that does orienting, a basal ganglia that makes decisions about sequencing, and those two things together give, give us reasonably lifelike behavior in our, our robot scratchbot. And that's quite a lot of what we have running now on the new robot Miro is this system. It's for orienting and exploring, and we can use it, we use it here for tactile orienting, but of course the same system can underlie orienting to sounds if you can localize those in space and orienting to, to visual stimuli too. So it turns out that this isn't a complete a solution to the problem of orienting for our whiskered robot. And that's because sometimes our robot would uh, stop as it was moving around and just move and investigate a, a point in space where nothing was happening. We called that a ghost orient. And the problem is that the whiskers, because they're moving back and forth, they sometimes generate signals in the strain gauges that are detecting bending of the whisker. And sometimes those signals, just as a consequence of the movement and the mass of the whisker, are strong enough to be above threshold to generate an orient. So you get, if you like, these ghost orienting movements towards stimuli that don't exist. And we know that uh, rats don't make these kind of ghost orients. So something else must be going on in the brain. And uh, one part of the brain that might be helping here is a region called the cerebellum which I'm not sure if you've covered that uh, in the summer school, but the cerebellum, uh, the st large structure at the back of the rat brain, one of its key functions seems to be to make predictions uh, about sensory signals, and particularly to be able to predict sensory signals that have been caused by your own movement. And there's a lovely experiment that's been done by Blakemore et al., uh, where they put people into a scanner, and they investigated how they responded to tickling stimuli. So, of course, if, if somebody tickles you, that can be quite amusing. But unfortunately, if you try to tickle yourself, it's really uninteresting. It doesn't work as, as a stimulus. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's worth thinking about why it is that self-tickling is so unrewarding. And one of the reasons is that it's just not surprising. You know what's, what's going to happen when you tickle yourself. Whereas if somebody else is doing it, it's unexpected and surprising. So why is self-tickling uh, uh, unexpected? Why is it not surprising? It must be because the brain expects and anticipates the signal that it's going to get. And what Blakemore uh, et al. did was to show that the cerebellum really lights up when you try to tickle yourself because it's estimating and predicting the sensory signal and using that to cancel out, if you like, the, signaling that, the signal that's coming from your skin. The same thing is happening in electric fish, which, which uh, generate this uh, broad electric field which they use for uh, catching prey, and they need to be able to tell the difference between a distortion to the electric field uh, caused by a prey animal and a distortion caused by their own movement, by swimming. And they do that by having a very large cerebellum. So we put a, a model of cerebellum in our whiskered robot, and the cerebellum predicts the noise that you might get due to the movement of the whiskers and it learns online to accurately predict what noise signals you might get and to cancel them out so you get a, a much better signal to noise ratio in the robot. So uh, we've dealt with uh, whisking uh, and we've dealt with orienting but uh, as you saw with that rat on the windowsill the whisker movements are really precise and they're really controlled and the rat seems to really care about how it's moving its whiskers and how it's touching. We call this active sensing. And if you look at these high-speed videos, you can see, for instance, this rat when it's exploring this perspex block. Uh, the whiskers aren't moving in a stereotyped, symmetric way. 
uh, you can see that here the whiskers on the right hand side are really reaching round to try and reach the other side of the block. If you watch this rat here, you see that too. You've got asymmetry. And you'll see that even as the, the rat comes up to the cylinder here, the whiskers uh, at the front are pushing forward while the ones at the back are hardly moving at all. So there's some ability to control even the whiskers on one side of the head. And uh, when you move your fingers, of course, there's some coupling between your finger movements. You can't move them entirely independently. And each of these whiskers has its own muscle. So there's, there's a, a degree of independence in how the whiskers can move. And we find that uh, when we record over long intervals. So this was a study in which we recorded uh, uh, the whisking muscles using EMG, and that's the sound that you can hear as a rat explored. And we tracked uh, the rat as he was moving around, and we showed that whenever he came close to the edge of the box here, the whiskers would become asymmetric, and the whiskers that were furthest away from the wall would push round to try and touch the sides of the box. The whiskers that were close to the wall would barely move at all. So we want to put that kind of control into our robot. So uh, I briefly want to come back to this question of how we decompose control. So in our uh, original uh, robot that was controlled by the basal ganglion is collecting cans. We de decompose behaviors into the different elements of behavior, uh, looking for a can, picking it up, carrying it to the wall, these sorts of things. And if we look in the ethology literature, we find that people have talked about these kinds of decompositions. There's a very famous paper by Behrens about the herring gull. And with the herring gull, there's, there's this famous experiment where the, the uh, egg rolls out of the nest, and the bird will retrieve the egg with its bill and push it back into the nest. And it will do this same action uh, really reliably and repeatedly. Uh, and it can do it with eggs of various size. It might even do it for a Coke can. And if you take the egg away during the movement, it will still complete the movement. And uh, ethologists have called this a fixed action pattern. So it may be that behavior is decomposed into action patterns. Uh, and that's one of the ways, for instance, in which Rodney Brooks wanted to de decompose robot behavior. We decompose it into different things we might want the robot to do. And we can do that with our whiskered robots. Here's another one, uh, with its behavior decomposed into different kinds of, if you like, orienting behaviors and fixed action patterns. Another way to decompose behavior is to think about where your attention is. So where you put your attention might decide what you're going to do next. And for an animal that doesn't have arms, and of course uh, most animals except humans uh, and some primates don't usually use their forelimbs for much, uh, much else other than locomotion. And they primarily are positioning their uh, head and their face, and their, their main effect of then is their mouth. So where you position your attention could determine uh, what you're going to do next. So another way of decomposing control is to solve the attention problem first. And then once you've solved that, the problem of what you're going to do is simplified. So in this uh, robot, we're controlling it by deciding where its attention should go, and then the rest of the body kind of follows. When humans have spatial attention, of course, we, we explore that in the visual modality, and we look at the saccadic eye movements that people make. So in a famous experiment, uh, Albert Yarbus had people looking at this picture and tracking where their eyes would look. And of course, we look at the uh, socially significant elements of the picture, uh, people's faces and so on, not just uh, uh, arbitrary points of light or corners and so on. And we can uh, actually calculate a saliency map for space and say, what are the important parts of space uh, for exploring and attending to? And we've taken that idea and transferred it into our uh, model for understanding the rat. And we've thought about tactile saliency maps. So can we, with a sense of touch, think about areas of the world which are important to explore and understand through touch? And can we use that to control the movement of our robot, or in this case, our simulation. So here we have a form of emergent wall following, which is a consequence of the rat's spatial attention being driven by contact with vertical objects, which we, uh, we, we program it so that, that, that vertical surfaces are salient and interesting. And it has this uh, salient zone, and it tries to put its whiskers into the salient zone. And then here is, is a robot instantiating this. This is Ben Mitchinson, who's programmed many of these robots. And 
So what we're doing now is following this uh, biologically inspired orienting uh, system to explore shapes. And in this case, he, he put his own face in front of the robot. And you can see the, the robot making light touches against his face and investigating it, uh, looking, uh, making a series, if you like, exploratory touches, somewhat like saccades, somewhat what you might, like what you might imagine a blind person would do if they were investigating your face to try and recognize you. And Mitra Hartman from Northwestern has shown that you can take signals off these kinds of whiskers and, and reconstruct a face. So uh, it, it, it should be possible from this to, to build up from the touches, the sequence of touches, uh, a lot of rich information about the object that's being investigated. How much time? I need to finish. OK, let me just skip through. So we've been doing working on the, on the cortex. We have a number of models of that, which I'd like to show you. But, um, I wanted to just finish just to make contact with John's talk uh, is that we've been doing in our robots uh, tactile simultaneous localization and mapping. So this is our, our whiskered robot. And we have various models for this, some of which are more hippocampal like this one I think was more of an engineered model. But you can see the robot just using touch on these artificial whiskers, building up a map of its environment. Uh, these two lines show its dead reckoning position and its calculated position. And uh, just using touch, we can build up uh, a reasonably accurate map of the world that we're exploring. So uh, Giorgio will, will talk about the iCub. And uh, I just wanted to mention that in the work we're doing with Giorgio, we are very much trying to understand human cognition. I wrote a short article for New Scientist on the possibility that robots might one day have selves.